Matt Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Woo! Jesus is in our business today in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. In what seemed like a never-ending charge of love. I want to talk about that, but I think we ought to start in a little softer place. (laughs) Country Western singer and amazing mandolin player, Marty Stewart, suggests that today in Nashville, there is very little creativity Uh, because Nashville and its country western scene is driven by impersonal data. And so record executives, Marty says, choose artists that will sell well based upon the data. And what this does is it stunts creativity in music because it doesn't allow people to share creative ideas in the same way, to give each other a hand up, to bring people into the country music community that have something to add for its future development. And instead of country music as it used to be, a family, if you will, of people who worked together and helped each other to create country music. Today, it is driven instead by sales. Karen Carpenter puts it succinctly. She says, country music has lost its living room. It's lost its living room. That place where people gather, where kin gather together to undertake their work. Jesus challenges us, I think, to practice here amongst ourselves with those you agree with and with those you don't agree with, clergy, people, uh, everything, acts of love. I mean, that really is what, how Jesus begins, uh, how we begin this chapter. It's how he continues. It all begins with love. The collect today even focuses in, if you will, gives us a lens of love through which we are to read the texts uh, today. Here are the seeds of peace and love that Jesus invites us to that may take root here in the midst of our congregations. And if we dismiss Jesus' teaching in this place, what's to keep us from rejecting it out in the world as we go? How we live our lives here together is but a beginning point for the rest of the week. Jesus is clear in redefining kinship and asking and inviting a different kind of community life, one that will treat even violence, not with judgment and dismissal, but rather to meet it with peace and love. And it is, this is a radical, radical vision of community. It's a, a, a notion uh, that changes our very Theology, the way we think of church or the way of being Christian together in this place or out in the world. It is, as we get ready for our confirmations, receptions, and reaffirmations, we will hear the kind of invitation to be a different community in our baptismal covenant or baptismal kinship, if you will, family, brothers and sisters in Christ is well-defined. It's a call to a beatitude, a blessedness, to accept a different set of norms 
than the culture around us. And it is something missional that expands our ability to see God's face in each other, not just here, not just here in this place where we practice it, but to see that in the world around us with our friends and neighbors, family, etc. But this has been hard, has it not? Uh, not just in church, it's just been hard in the community with different visions around the pandemic and uh, political divisions. And so the message is timely for us. But this is, there's something here that's deeper, a notion tied to Christ and Christ's person himself. It's intimately born in Jesus himself, who we call the Prince of Peace. Jesus, in his own punishment, I mean, think about this, in his own punishment, trial, way of the cross and death, lives out and exemplifies every word of today's gospel lesson. Each piece of his invitation to us, he lives out in the torment of his last days, facing it, not with anger, resentment, but with love and peace. The Jesus we proclaim is a Jesus who said, uh, said this and gave his life living the beatitude itself. Uh, and I don't think we can deny that. <laughs> we can't separate it out from the deep Christology of who he is. Uh, and as he dies, I mean, think about this very piece. As he dies, he forgives those who have done this to him. We should pause and be curious, I think, about the long list of those that you and I hold in contempt. We probably, given enough time, could write the names on a piece of paper, couldn't we? I could. <laughs> Family, moms, dads, brothers and sisters, typically the most intimately known are those we hold the most against co-workers and peers, political enemies, those we lashed out on social media against this week. Jesus' cross adheres to God's mission of forgiveness, a forgiveness of our sins that's born in the embrace of the very Lord and Savior that we worship, who returns love, mercy, and forgiveness and peace to those who persecute him. And to suggest that Jesus calls us to peace and love and merely as a code of ethics or a way of following Jesus is actually to dismiss, I think, the very deep theological character of who we're to be as Christian community when we say we are the body of Christ. One last consideration this morning, and I think this is very important. Some of us cannot do this. And thanks for Paul this morning and his passage who reminds us of the difference between the seed that's laid into the ground and has to die versus the seed that will be born eternally, the brokenness of human bodies. Some of us cannot forgive and love in the way that Jesus says. It's just too soon. It's just too soon. Maybe the pain is too great or the sting too fresh. I mean, we're human after all in very real relationships. In this case, though, I think we must begin to pray, to learn to forgive, to learn peace and love. Maybe let Jesus carry our cross of unforgiveness for a little while, while we work on what's before us. The action Jesus encourages is not one that simply says, I can't do it, so we get off the hook. Instead, it's one that continuously invites us to do this work. Moreover, in this secular age, in this time in which Church and Christians and all religious people seem so foreign in the landscape of our communities. We actually have to practice this as we live an embodied life in the world. And I think this will put us at risk somewhat. 
I would suggest that the work for you in this place will be to continue your formation, mending the broken pieces of your life here amongst each other and claiming a living room that is safe for people who disagree to come together. Uh, Learn creatively from each other to love beyond brokenness, beyond competition, beyond the sense of scarcity, to actually accept, accept the love that reaches out from the hardwood of the cross and embraces us, but all human beings. And to realize that there's plenty to go around. There's plenty to go around. God is inviting us to share God's love for our human, for our human love is weak. We're to multiply God's love to bring abundant grace and peace and love into the world. And that begins here in this congregation, in our congregations, and then in your own life and in your family, in your workplaces, and all those communities that you bump into during the week. It is hard, isn't it? It's okay to name it. It's okay to say, Jesus is pretty tough. It's okay to say, I'm struggling. But Jesus will continue to invite us to act with love first and to see each other as Christ's own handiwork. And as hard as it may be, my friends, that is an amazing gift of mercy that allows us to make our pilgrimage with each other in this world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter, at Texas Bishop, and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.